couple of weeks back, I began to speak about a theme which I'm going to revisit. Some of what I share today will be a repeat, but a lot of it will be new. I'm going, we've been going through the book of Ephesians. God and man in the church has been our theme of Ephesians. And we are in Ephesians chapter 6, and where we are now is verses 10 forward, 10 through 20 actually. We'll be looking that shortly. And as I said, I'll be repeating some of the things I said, but there'll be a lot of new stuff. This is called Pulling Back the Veil, Part 2. Uh, I had opened before. We had just had this eclipse. And something happens in an eclipse that is quite remarkable. If you are in the place where the full shadow is, you actually see the stars when the full solar eclipse happens. That's a very remarkable and unusual event. You have to be right in the path of the full shadow. But my point is this. Those stars are there all the time. We just are not aware of it. Our eyes have to be open. A veil of sorts has to be pulled away. Well, what I want to say today is that there is an invisible world that we do not see that is around us all the time. It's there all the time. We simply don't see it, yet the Bible reveals it to us. We're going to look at that revelation today. It is a world full of forces and powers that are at work among us that are some ways hidden, some ways mysterious, and yet which the Lord speaks about. I want to explore that today because Paul explores it in the book of Ephesians. I want to explore it uh, as well. Now, we looked uh, last time, and, and uh, this, this is what C.S. Lewis said in the Screw Tape Letters, and I think it's important for us to remember this. When we talk about the unseen world, when we talk about the demonic world, when we talk about the world of spiritual life and forces, Lewis says there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race, that is humans, can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist and a magician with the same delight. What I want to say today is that uh, as we talk about what in Greek are called uh, rulers and authorities, or sometimes translated principalities and powers, we're talking about forces that are very significant and can be a means through which demonic forces operate. But one thing I am, uh, I, I am looking at this honestly and biblically, one thing I'm not doing, I do not want to stimulate a deceptive fascination with the unseen world, a deceptive fascination with the unseen world, because that is what New Age spirituality is about. That is what some cults are about. We'll get to that a little bit later. It's also what Gnosticism is about, that this, uh, this uh, physical world is kind of a facade. It's a lesser world. The physical world reveals the glory of God. God made it. Christ died for you, spirit, soul, and body, a human being, flesh and blood. He died to redeem you. You're not an afterthought. The physical world is not an afterthought. It is good, the scripture says, and it reveals God's glory. Nevertheless, there is also an invisible world. So while I don't want to provoke an unhealthy fascination, I do not want to deny the reality that while we live in a physical world that Christ is redeeming and that uh, his purpose, uh, purposes and glory are revealed, there is also this invisible world that is at work all around us, the world of God's Holy Spirit, the world of the angelic, and yes, the world of the demonic, and these are very powerful forces, we are told, by Scripture. Here's what we're told in Ephesians chapter 1. When Christ was raised from the dead, God worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion 
and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. In other words, Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he is above all of these spiritual forces that I'm referring to, all of these things that we don't quite see and can only discern by revelation. Christ is far more powerful than any of them, and he rules over them. Paul goes on to talk about this further in Ephesians chapter 6, which is where we are in the book of Ephesians. So this, in expository, we go through the book. Here we are. We take a look at this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, Paul says, that works, words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So here we are. Paul is talking about these rulers and authorities, principalities and powers, thrones, dominion, kind of a mysterious discussion, and he doesn't go into great detail, but as we read the scriptures, we can understand what he's referring to as we consider. So the question is, what are the principalities and powers? What are the rulers and authorities that Paul is referring to here? And the best definition I have is that they are created realities that give an order to society, they are capable of having either a constructive or detrimental effect. They are called uh, arche and exousia. The word arche is a significant word. It's where we get the word architect, monarchy, oligarchy. It has to do with rule, with order. And one of the words that uh, we get from arche this idea of ruling, this idea of structure, this idea of definition, is the word anarchy, anarchy. Anarchy is no order. It's very interesting, and this is one thing we should be praying against. Historically, whenever you have a natural disaster like a hurricane going through an error area, what you get is a destruction of the set up, uh, set up systems of order set up systems of policing, set up systems of, of the, uh, the authorities and the orders of the state and of the, of the orders of human endeavor. They're destroyed and you have anarchy. Anarchy is a horrible situation to live in. Anarchy means everyone is threatened by the lack of order. So what's confusing about this is that these RK are for our benefit, but because we live in a fallen world, they can also be twisted and turned to function against us. They can be demonized, okay? These forces which is intended for our good become evil, not because they are evil in themselves, but because there are unseen forces that find partnership, that find entrance, that find opportunity to accomplish destructive purposes. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly, but 
The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He takes the created order and he distorts it for his own purposes. And this is what we see. So our question is, how do they work? They distort good things for evil purposes. They find expression through the creative power of mankind. They take what we create and distort it for evil purposes. So you think of any great discovery that we have made for good it also because of sin, and I believe because of this dynamic, can be used for evil. So we live in a world where we never fully escape from these influences. And as Christians, we become very sensitive to them. And in fact, as Christians, we become adversaries to them. They influence much of life. They are looking for seats of influence in many places, existing places that bring order and life. Again, um, Erickson tells us as creative realities, and we're told in Colossians that Jesus created the unseen things. He created the principalities and powers. As created realities, the principalities and powers are not inherently evil. They are specifically mentioned in Colossians 1.16, among all, the all things created by Christ and for Christ. They are therefore part of God's plan for his creation. Uh, there is in creation a visible foreground of physical things and an invisible background. The powers which were created as instruments of God's love, as bonds between God and man, as aids and signposts toward the servants of God, they form the framework within which such service must needs be carried back, carried out. They are ordering principles intended to keep the creation from falling into chaos. The arche keep us from falling into chaos. The fall, however, has affected the entire creation. Not only are the individual human members of creation now separated and alien from God, but also the powers that organize and influence them. That's a heavy thought. Are you still out there? Amen. Okay. They want to influence all of life. They want a seat in everything we do. They want to influence everything we do. They want to influence the good things we do, and they want to distort them. They want to influence the creative things we do, and they want to distort them. They want a seat in the courtroom. They want a seat in the classroom. They want a seat on the board of the seminary, of the board of directors. They want a seat in the board of law school, board of directors. They want to distort and transform things. They want a seat in the newsroom. They want a seat in the business boardroom. They want a seat in the studio. They want to take something beautiful and creative like art and distort it for distorted purposes. And they would love to have a place in the pulpit. <laughs> love it. I mean, love it. What do you think heresy is about? What do you think distorted doctrine is about? What do you think lies in the name of the Lord are about? So, I have taught in Ukraine, and we have sons, daughters, grandsons, granddaughters of those who have been imprisoned for their faith. It's a very interesting uh, dynamic. We work with those who have been imprisoned for their faith uh, in the old days of the Soviet Union. They know what it means to be fighting, struggling with 
not just personal temptation or personal attacks, but systems and forces that are opposed to faith and have paid great prices. These, these people do not take for granted what they have. They cherish what has been given to them. And they uh, themselves or their parents or their grandparents have paid great price. And they realize there's a struggle that is going on. There's a wrestling match that's going on. There's a great temptation that's going on. I saw a video that was played in one of the uh, uh, chapels at the seminary there where I go and teach. Gary Frankson's been there with me. Some others of you have. And um, there was this amazing video. And in the video, it was made by a Christian uh, musician who had been imprisoned, put in a psychiatric prison for his faith. And he was released, and he made this video. It was an amazing thing. And in the video, there's kind of an assembly line. And in the assembly line, there are very human people with very human features moving along. And as they move along, they're put into kind of assembly along, and there is this thing that stamps them. It's like a big robotic arm that stamps them. And it was captured so beautifully in the video. They're very human as they go along, and then once that stamp hits their forehead, they have this weird lobotomized look, this look of part human, part machine. And they know that we are wrestling against something that wants to absolutely conform us to something that is opposed to our humanity, our godly humanity, and to the purposes of God. This is the nature of our wrestling match. We see this in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is talking about this. Authority was given it to this beast over every tribe and people and language and nation and all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world and the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. That's incredible to think about that. It causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, slave and free, to be marked on the right hand and the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Now, I'm not saying that Paul is necessarily talking about that in Ephesians 6. This is its final and full manifestation. It's a powerful force. It's a pervasive force. It's something that we face everywhere. We face personally and we face corporately. And the Bible talks about it. These are the principalities and powers that are, we are wrestling with. They take what is good. They take the governance, they take what brings order, they take what establishes the opportunity to do good and to do commerce and to do good things in society, and they distort it, potentially. That's what happens. At least that's what the scripture tells us. So, if this is so, if this scripture is true that I've been quoting to you, what are the stakes in this warfare. What are the stakes? First stake is enslavement. The enemy of our soul wants to enslave us. Second stake is destroying our relationship with God. That's really what the enemy of our soul is after. I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly, says Jesus. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So we see this uh, in the book Pilgrim's Progress. It's a deceptive kind of desire to enslave us. I have something wonderful for you. I have something great for you. But it's false. And in Pilgrim's Progress, Pilgrim says, it came burning hot into my mind. Whatever he said and however he flattered, when he got me home to his house, he would sell me for a slave. The enemy of our soul never comes offering something terrible. I have something really awful for you here. 
I really want to give something terrible. This is going to make you sick. This is going to destroy your life. Do this, and you'll never have peace again for the rest of your life. Do this, you'll destroy all your relationships. Do this, you'll destroy your health. Do this little pill, blow your mind, you'll lose it. It's wonderful. That's not the way he operates. I have something wonderful for you. It came burning hot into my mind, says Pilgrim. Whatever he said and however he flattered, when he got me home to his house, he would sell me for a slave. That's how he works. He's an angel of light. He's a deceptive spirit. But what he's really after is to destroy our relationship with God. We see this in the book of Job. When Satan appears in the heavenlies, in the heavenly court, with the angels of God, and he has access, his goal is very simple. Not simply to attack Job, but to destroy Job's relationship with God, and that is always his goal. His goal is to destroy your relationship with God. His goal is to make you to believe that God does not love you. God does not have your best interest in mind. God, uh, God is not trustworthy. God is not concerned for you. Jesus Christ's life puts the lie to that. God is fully for you. God has fully devoted to you. God lays down his life for you in Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross that you might have life and that more abundantly. But the enemy constantly wants to destroy that connection. And that's why he says to God, he says, ah, stretch out your hand. Touch all that he has. He will curse you to your face. That was the wager. I can destroy his relationship with you. It appeared that God had forgotten Job, but he hadn't forgotten Job. But even more importantly, Job did not forget God. And that's why when you and I are under stress, you and I are under attack, you and I are questioning, you and I are wrestling, you and I are under intense pressure, and it happens to all of us from time to time, and you may be there right this very moment. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. But it's not present in your mind. You have to remind yourself of that truth. That is revealed truth. That is revealed truth. It is biblical truth. And that's why Paul says, take up the armor and stand. Stand. Because you do have to persevere in this battle. You will break through. You will break through. I don't know why. This is the case, but it is. And this is what is required of us. We'll look at this further in a few moments. Now, so what is our attitude? Paul says we're to be vigilant. He says, uh, take up the whole armor of God. Be prepared. Don't be silly or foolish about this. This is a reality. Persevere. Understand that this is an ongoing battle that you are involved in. We are to be fierce or aggressive. I'll explain that in a moment. This is not a passive battle. It's an active battle, taking up the armor of God, using the word of God, which are his promises. If you are stuck, find the promises of God. They are like gold. They're so powerful. And they will break through. They will defeat your enemy. We are to be united. We are to persevere in prayer for one another. We are a army. We are soldiers. Paul talks about the church as the body of Christ, the family of God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he, the bride of Christ. And here he talks about us as soldiers in Christ's army, a troop, an army, not individual soldiers on Patrol, we are together united, praying for one another, caring for one another, supporting one another in prayer. We are communal. That's part of being united. We are part of a community, not a single lone warrior out on, um, uh, uh, on, the, on the horizon, 
by himself or herself. There's a famous story I've told you several times about a man named George Olslager who wrote a book, uh, wrote an article called The Lion Rules of Warfare. Now, a lot of songs we talk about, we talk about Jesus as the lion. Sometimes the enemy is referred to as a lion, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's a great, uh, a great uh, uh, article that he wrote, and uh, I think it applies to this message. Uh, there's a, a, a park uh, between uh, South Africa and I think uh, Mozambique or Congo, and uh, it's the Kruger National Park, and there's man-eating lions there. And uh, every year, uh, people are killed by lions, and uh, there was a war in one of the countries and drove a lot of refugees through the park. And they found a man who had been killed by a lion, and the forensic experts go and reproduced the, uh, the event and kind of examine what happened here. What, what happened to this man? And they said, you know what? This guy made four mistakes. His first mistake was we could tell by the footprints and by what was going on here that he was traveling alone. There's no one else there who is all by himself, totally a prey. His second mistake was that he was traveling at night. That's where the lion comes out. He's hunting. She actually is hunting at night. The guy's just kind of sitting back waiting for the ladies to take care of business. Uh, that's how it works, you know. <clears throat> there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of uh, insight right there, <laughs> I think. But... Uh, So he's traveling at night. Thirdly, he, they say, you know what? He has no weapon, not even a stick. Uh, these are all really bad things to be doing in the Kruger National Park at night where there are man-eating lions. They said the fourth thing that he did sealed his fate. They could tell by reconstructing the footprints, looking at what had happened. They said it's quite obvious that when he saw the lion, he ran away. And as soon as he began running, that lion knew he had a weak prey, chased him down, and destroyed him. Well, the lesson's very simple. The next time you see a lion, <laughs> you just stand there. Right? <laughs> Sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. Withstand the lion. Resist him, firm in your faith. Having done all, therefore, stand. Having your armor, your breastplate of righteousness, your shield of faith, your belt of truth, the helmet of the hope of salvation, the feet shod, preparation of the gospel's peace, your weapon, the sword of the spirit. You must engage. You cannot flee. I want to give you a warning about this. Our Chrysostom, the fourth century bishop who really has said some, some remarkable things. If you are, and preaching on this passage, if you are fierce toward him, he loses his fierceness. If you are compliant, then he will be fierce. Resist him firm in your faith. Now I want to just mention those lion rules of warfare. I want to mention a couple of things. The warfare is not physical. The warfare is not passive, and the warfare requires re weaponry. I want to give you a warning. Beware of false spirituality, and beware of dualism. Dualism says that there are two equal and opposite powers. There's God and the devil, and they're wrestling it out, and God's trying to get control. And one person actually said, God's, in, God's sovereign, but he's not in charge. God is sovereign, he is in charge, he is in control, he is all-powerful. All forces are under Jesus' feet. There is no, there is no equality. There's no equality whatsoever. 
And false spirituality is fascinated with the details of some of these things. I want you to be careful about that. Be careful. Because it quickly can become cultish. Cults promote the false idea that God has revealed something special to them and not to anyone else. This is usually a truth that has never been revealed and supersedes and contradicts all previous revelations. That's according to Josh McDowell and uh, another man named, last name of Stuart. Cult is a group of people polarized around someone's interpretation of the Bible is characterized by major deviation, deviations from Orthodox Christianity. Be careful in the area of demonology and eschatology. We become fascinated with these things. I'm just giving you a warning. Paul talks about it. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous minds and not holding fast to the head. In other words, it's about my revelation. It's not about Jesus Christ. That's the problem. Another case is this. When Jesus uh, had his disciples come back and they had shown power and authority over the demonic, they said, even the demons are subject to us. That was their focus. That was their interest. Jesus says, this is true. This is true, and it's a good thing. But do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's always about Jesus. He has given us weapons. He has given us authority. But the elders cast their crowns at his feet, always. It's always what it's about. And when we become morbidly interest in our own revelation and how spiritual we are, we open ourselves to the same thing that Lucifer was opened to. It's a warning. As a pastor, do you mind if I warn you? So, I'm saying there is an unseen world and powerful spirits vie for ascendancy. We encounter them, and we must resist them. They come against us personally. They come against us corporately. Some people say that there are demons in the machines. I don't believe that. We're just, at least most of the time. In Christ... We are fully equipped to live in triumph over them. If you don't hear anything else I've said today, remember two things. This is a reality, and we are fully equipped to live in triumph over them through Jesus Christ. Those are the two important things. This is what is revealed when we pull back the veil, their reality and our triumph in the person of Christ. We are empowered to support and intercede for one another when each of us goes through the most strenuous of spiritual battles, and we all face them. Yes, there are emotional battles, there are relational battles, there are psychological battles, but many, if not all of them, have a spiritual component. So there are spiritual battles that we all must fight. We must the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We are to bring every thought captive into obedience to Jesus Christ. That is our authority. That is our calling. That is our ability. And we take the word of God and we confront and we defeat these forces in people's lives. It takes great discernment, though, to understand how this functions, and that's why you need to be in the scriptures to comprehend what God teaches here. So what is our solution? You must know the true master of the universe. Uh, my kids used to want to watch these shows. We never let them 
watch the masters of the universe. It's kind of interesting. Uh, there was one character who always came up and says, I have the power. It just rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> I do know that every, at least every little boy wants to say, I have the power. You know, they all want to say that. And you know, I've kind of cooled off about that a little bit. But there's something about the demonic realm and the human realm that doesn't want to recognize the true master of the universe and we operate only through him. How do we know he's the master of the universe? We've just been told he's seated far above principalities, powers, thrones, and dominions. Everything is under his feet. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, arcane exusia, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Isn't this amazing? This act of self-sacrifice is the means by which these forces have been disarmed. That's totally counterintuitive. They have been disarmed by the cross of Jesus Christ. It is his blood, his sacrifice, and his life that gives you power over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means, we are told, harm you. So in closing, I want to bring this word to your mind that confirms what we've just read. Be sober. Sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. Brothers and sisters, persevere. Embrace the master of the universe. Stand in him. And when you are attacked, and when you face hard things, resist the enemy. He will flee from you. You may suffer, but God himself will bless you in the end. Amen. Amen.